We good? <clears throat> um, some devotees put on a conference earlier this year. It was on it was online, so it was a retreat. But it was a retreat that was conducted entirely online. It might have been at the end of last year, I can't remember. But within the last year. And uh, they invited me to be part of a panel discussion. And the name of the conference was Mantra, which is painful for me to even say. For, for a few reasons. Uh, number one is there's no ah sound in the Sanskrit language. Like if you ask an Indian person to say alachua, they'll say alachua, which actually means mouth of Allah. So it's, a, it's an interesting statement. But anyway, that ah sound, it doesn't exist. And it's, it's actually... Once you learn that you can live your life without saying ah to people, it becomes almost like, an, it's almost like a guttural. It's almost like sometimes the Middle Eastern languages with their you know, plethora of guttural noises sounds a little bit offensive. So also the ah sound. And so mantra, which means advice or um, incantation later on. Initially the word mantra meant advice. And so the mantra was the advisor to the king. And uh, comes from man. Man in, in Sanskrit is a verbal root that means to think or to contemplate. Um, you know how sometimes they say mantra is that thing which triate frees or delivers manaha, the mind? That's not true. That's not the etymology of the word. You get sometimes with a language, you'll get folk etymologies, which means after a word has come into a language, then they'll go back retroactively and they'll re-envision the origin of the word based on what the words come to mean. But they're not actually going back in history. They're just giving you a class. Forgive the example, but like hamburgers, some people thought they came from Hamburg in Germany. They didn't. I don't know where the word actually comes from. That has nothing whatsoever to do. But there was a, you know, there was a folk etymology that ran around for decades that that's where the word came from. And so many times you'll get a word, it'll have an origin, and somebody will just make something up. Well, oh, here's and they'll, they'll take the different syllables of the word and they'll match them up. It's very, very common in the Sanskrit commentatorial tradition where pundits will do this and they'll display their cleverness and they also turn into a class. So a mantra is that which delivers the mind and therefore, you know, you should, you know, you should chant mantras if you're interested in liberation. They'll, they'll turn into a class like that. Anyway, man to think becomes mantra, which means advice, and then later on, mantra became incantation or spell, and it also came to refer to prayers. Technically, we don't, what you guys just did, we weren't chanting mantras. We call it the Maha Mantra, the great mantra, but it's actually not true. When we chant Hare Krishna, we're not chanting a mantra. Mantras are sentences in Sanskrit. And they have certain, um, they have verbs, and they especially have the declension of nouns to form the statement into, a, to form the statement. So like, Om Krishnaya Namaha would be a mantra to Krishna. Om Krishnaya Namaha means Om. It's, that's also there in mantras. You have to chant a beach syllable. And then namaha means respects from nam, which also is a verbal root. Namaha, respects, krishnaya, unto Krishna or to Krishna. It's in the dative case. 
So it turns it into a prepositional phrase. Respects to Krishna. Do you guys follow this? Respects unto Krishna. Um, the, the Hare Krishna mantra does, it's, it's called, in our tradition, we call it Krishna Nam. Krishna Nam. It's the name of God. It has no mantra quality. You're not asking for anything. It's not a formula. It's not an incantation. It's rather just crying out to a force bigger than yourself. One time Prabhupada was asked to translate Hare Krishna into English, and he said, Oh my friend, oh my friend, as the translation. Because you're just crying out to Krishna. Krishna Ram Hadi, Krishna Ram Hada. You're just crying out to the deity. You're not asking for anything. So it's called Krishna Nam in our tradition. Not Krishna Nam. Krishna Nam. And Krishna Mantra is the sixth of the seven Gayatri mantras that you get when you take second initiation in our movement. We get seven secret mantras. They're not secret like in a bad way. They're just, they're just you know, that's, you're supposed to receive them from your guru and it's not supposed to be something you read out of a book or something like that. And so there's seven of them. We chant them ten times each, three times a day. It doesn't take that long. It takes a few minutes. Um, but th that sixth of the seven Gayatri mantras is called Krishna Mantra in our tradition. And so although we call this the Maha Mantra, I think that's advertising. It's for hype purposes. If you, if you really want to get into it, it's Krishna Nam. That's when we're talking amongst ourselves, how we refer to it. Sometimes for outreach purposes, we'll call it the Maha Mantra to attract people that this is, if you're in the mantras, chant this one. It's the Maha Mantra. It's the great mantra. But within our own crew, we, uh, we call it Krishna Nam. Nam Kirtan. Prem Nam Kirtan. We don't call it Mantra Kirtan. It's Nam Kirtan. It's the Kirtan of Krishna's name. Nam Sankirtan, the collective chanting of Krishna's name. Prem Nam Sankirtan, the loving, love-laden, collective chanting of Krishna's name. These are the kind of uh, ways that our own tradition describes amongst ourselves, when we're talking amongst ourselves. Just like the word Hindu doesn't show up in any of our sacred texts, unless we're talking about our interface with Muslims. In medieval texts, when we were interfacing with Muslims, then we would refer to ourselves as Hindus and we would refer to them as Yavanas. But when we're talking amongst ourselves, we have other words. Vaishnav, Gaudiya Vaishnav, Krishna Bhakta. We have different words we use in our own discussions amongst other pious Hindu groups to designate our particular sect and differentiate it from others. It's only when we're talking to outsiders that we use the term Hindu, which is an outsider's term. It's a Persian term. It predates Islam. It's coined by traders who came from the Middle East, across the Silk Road, came to India. They, they coined the term Hindu. The Muslims picked it up because they were from the same part of the world, so they were familiar with it. It was a standard term to use for people from India. But it's not our term. It's not in our texts. And it does show up in the medieval text, but again, with outsiders. So, um, I attended a lecture called Mantra, which just, it's like nails on a chalkboard for me. I spent so many years of my life learning how not to say ah. Like people say Sanskrit. Not Sanskrit. It's an acceptable Anglicization if you don't know anything about the language, but it's 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 a painful sound to hear. So anyway, they were clever. They took the term mantra, and they want it was a men's conference. It was for men. Women weren't allowed to attend. 
It's an anti-woman conference. Just kidding. It was a men's conference. It wasn't anti-anything. It was pro-men. It wasn't anti-women. But they got clever, and so it was mantra, and then they, they called it mantra, which simultaneously I appreciated their cleverness, and I also thought it was totally disturbing, and I, I can't even say it without like, getting triggered and giving a whole class on it. Um, so anyway, they had a bunch of different lectures, and I think I was chosen to be a part of a panel on um, being a father, being a father. And uh, there were a few others on the conference <laughs> who probably won't want to do panel discussions with me in the future, and you'll, you'll find out why in a minute. Um, uh, and, you know, I started out talking and I said, you know, really, sometimes you'll get together with a group of men just because you want to talk about something that's personal and you feel like if women were present it might get in the way of you being able to fully express yourself. Sometimes AA meetings, they'll have what are called stag meetings. I'm sure there's a girl equivalent of them, I just don't know the name of it, but a stag meeting in 12-step programs, Alcoholics Anonymous, close that door for me, would you? Thanks. Um, a stag meeting is a meeting that only men attend. And whatever the, I don't know what the, the deer, like I know stags and what are deers? I don't know what the, what the equivalent is. Um, doe, doe meetings, stag and doe meetings. I think that would probably be, if it followed through, that's what it would be. A doe is a doe, a doe, a female deer. Ray, a drop of golden sun. <laughs> it's from the sound of music. Um, okay, so sometimes in a stag meeting, you, you'll go to a meeting because you want to just sit with men and you feel like if women are there, it might get in the way of your ability to express yourself. But you're talking about issues with addiction in, in terms of a 12-step program. And they're the same issues that a woman would contend with you just feel most comfortable talking amongst people of the same sex. Did you follow this? But the topic of the conversation was fatherhood. Fatherhood is not parenthood. They could have had a men's conference and had a discussion on parenthood. And then it would have been us talking about parental struggles, but we want to do it with a bunch of other men. You follow? But they then chose to say the name of the conference was fatherhood. Fatherhood, the very term, means women are left out. Women can't be fathers. Only men can be fathers, just like men cannot be mothers. And so a men's conference on fatherhood means we have to figure out what is special about being a male parent. And so I made the point at the outset of the discussion, and this is why all of my colleagues on the panel probably secretly hate me, is because I made the point that anything you say that's also true for mothers is offensive because you're saying there's something about being a father, but it's also true about being a mother, and therefore it's about parents. And so if any of the things you want to talk about are equal for both men and women, then it's a parent conference, and you're going against what the organizers have said, or you're insulting women by saying that they don't have rights to have those same qualities. Did you follow this? So for instance, if you want to say, you know, you need to nurture your children, or you need to take care of them or provide for them, or you need to be strong for them. You're, by thinking that's specific to fathers, you're, actually, you're indirectly, and not even indirectly, you are directly insulting all the mothers out there who have equal rights to cultivating and expressing all of those feelings towards their children. Did you follow this? So I started at the beginning and I said, anything anybody says that's not specific to men and it could also be true for women 
is either offensive or it's ignorant. And then for the rest of the class, every single person who spoke came up with stuff that was true for women and, and everybody would get it. Wait a second, that's also true for women. And I set those parameters. I didn't set them. The people who made the conference set them. They just didn't think about it clearly enough. And so, yeah. Are you guys with me? You following us? So what is it about being a father? Today's Father's Day. I was probably chosen for the panel discussion because I have six kids. So, you know, I'm automatically chosen. It's like if you're a World War II vet, then they automatically give you a medal and call you up and ask you to speak a few words simply because everyone from World War II, practically speaking, is dead. And so the only, like, if there's four vets left in a state, they, you know, they get honors every time they go to a conference. So what is it about being a father that's different than being a mother? And of course, a, sim a simpler prerequisite form of that would be what is it about being a man that's different than being a woman? As far as my intelligence will allow, the only thing men have that women don't have is, are you ready for it? Ready. Upper body strength. Men have much more upper body strength than women. Generally speaking, when it comes to posterior chain strength, the strength of your, the back of your body, which is involved in every, almost every athletic movement you make, women who are the same weight as men, there's not a huge difference in strength levels. If you look at female powerlifters who squat, for instance, the level of strength is not that different than the level of men's strength. They have a slightly higher percentage of fat because of, of of breast material, which of course is what gives men their advantage in upper body strength. They don't have to, they don't have to lactate. Of course, what makes women special? They make babies and they lactate, which is pretty miraculous if you think about it. They produce all progeny and they also become a dairy farm miraculously. Like all the food they eat becomes digestible by children. It's totally wild if you think about it. It's like practically speaking a proof of God. If you just look at it, like prima facie, it's like, oh my God, there's mystic, there's my, m mystic order in the universe. Like that's crazy. They make milk? Are you kidding me? That's like ridiculous. Right? They eat apples and then milk comes out. Like, how does that even work? They grow another organ in their body to interface with the child. Their body's made to grow a baby and then the ba they actually are able to get the baby out. It's just like inconceivable. But anyway, how are men different than women? Men have a much, much, much higher degree of upper body strength than women do. If you look at female power lifters, they'll have huge squats and huge deadlifts, that's posterior chain, but their bench press will always be half, a third of what men's are. And upper body strength isn't just some random thing, it's also kind of mystical. Not quite as mystical and beautiful as giving birth and making babies and making milk, but upper body strength really translates to something else. Upper body strength translates to the capacity for violence. Technically, you can fight with your legs. It's true. But we've got opposable thumbs <laughs> and we have an incredible amount of dexterity in our hands and they protect the most vital parts of our body, namely our neck, and which is you know, defenseless and your feet don't do a great job of defending it. And so although it is, there, is, there are ways to fight with your legs, if you look at 
if you look at human combat, human combat is conducted largely by the hands and it always has been. And so when we say men have more upper body strength than women, what we really mean is men have a greater capacity for violence than women. Now the Industrial Revolution changed that to some extent. The invention of gunpowder changed that. The invention of firearms changed that. To some extent, the, the invention of bladed weapons changed that, but not completely. Firearms really made a big difference. Although men actually have a better like, hand-eye coordination than women do. And they also do better in shooting competitions, amazingly. If you look at the Olympics, for example. Um, so yeah men have a greater capacity for violence now violence isn't a bad thing violence makes you dangerous danger isn't a bad thing dangerous is bad if the person who's dangerous is your enemy the quality of being dangerous if the person is your friend is very valuable because if your friend is dangerous then they can protect you therefore men are different from women because of upper body strength upper body strength is synonymous with capacity for violence capacity for violence makes you dangerous and being dangerous makes you capable of protecting do you guys follow that? That's how men are different from women. That's how fathers are different than mothers. What's dangerous? Huh? What's dangerous in this context? Like, what do you mean dangerous? Dangerous means capable of hurting other people. <laughs> Synonymous with violence. It's just, I tried to, I wasn't really running. I wasn't like moving very far. I was just using synonyms to flesh out my point. Capacity for violence makes you dangerous of hurting somebody, because that's what violence means. And that makes you an asset to the people that you're stopping people from hurting. And that creates protection, and therefore protection is the consequence of the capacity for violence mixed with some compassion or love for people or affection for people. Do you guys follow this? That's what makes fathers different than mothers. Men used to be the breadwinners, the earners. But that doesn't have to be the case. Now, if you arm people, then, you know, a gun is just a whole different ballgame. And so now women would have an equal capacity for violence as men. The problem is if you arm women and they have a gun and that gun creates the capacity for violence, then they have to introduce lethal violence at every step, which is a problem. If you're a police officer and you get into a scuffle, problem and your only alternative your only option is to introduce lethal force namely a gun then every encounter is potentially a lethal encounter do you guys follow this capacity for violence can be mitigated it can be it can excuse me capacity for violence can be created with the introduction of weapons but then what happens is those weapons now introduce a lethal element in every confrontation. And as soon as a police officer pulls a gun on somebody, they don't get to put it away and then fight with them. Once they pull it out, it doesn't go away unless the threat is mitigated. And if the person continues to approach them or, or behave in a bad way, the only thing they can do is, is shoot them. And so when you, get, when you arm a police force, for instance, with guns, if those people aren't also capable of non-lethal force, if they aren't big and strong and they don't have a capacity for non-lethal violence, then every encounter is your zero to a hundred. You're having a conversation or you pull your gun because you can't get in the middle and mix it up with somebody in the middle using non-lethal force. Do you guys follow this? It's an objective argument, by the way, why men may be better suited for police work. And even amongst men, big men, big men who are trained to fight. Because then they don't have to go nuclear every single time and pull out their gun. 
And when the criminal is strong and knows how to fight, and a police officer is weak and doesn't know how to fight, the only way they can equalize that distance is by pulling a gun. And now you've got a guy who could beat you up, and the only thing stopping him is your gun. And he might think with your shaky hand that you're not going to do it, and then you've got no choice. You guys following us? Anyway. Um, Krishna says in the Gita, Pitaham, I am the father, Jagat, I am the father of the universe. He also says, Aham Bija Prada Pitaha, I am the sea giving father. Krishna also says, Mama Yoni, my womb gives rise to the universe. And Krishna also says, Pitaham uh, Asya uh, Jagato, Mata, Mata Jagata, I am the mother of the universe. So Krishna freely uses both male and female descriptors for himself to describe his relationship to the world. Krishna says the universe is created from my womb. He also says, I'm the seed-giving father. So in both of the elements, Krishna is claiming that. So using a sexual metaphor for the creation of the world with a, with a father and a mother, Krishna claims both. My womb, I'm the seed-giving father. And then Krishna also literally says, I'm the mother of the universe, I'm the father of the universe. So Krishna freely uses these gender roles to describe his relationship to us, to the world. I don't think gender roles are by themselves bad. Despite kind of current um, thought on this topic, there is like a kind of a large movement within feminism, the majority really, and also just sort of within woke society nowadays, that any distinctions made between men and women are negative and that we should view each other as equal. But differences don't necessarily have to create inequality. Those are two separate things. Differences don't necessarily have to create inequality. I think when people are upset about seeing differences, what they're really upset about is inequality. And if you address the inequality problem, then the differences could even be celebrated because they wouldn't have any exploitative teeth to them anymore. Do you follow this? When differences become inequalities, they can be used to exploit other people. If your differences just become differences, and they don't create inequality, then you can have an egalitarian society without putting on blinders and pretending you don't notice the differences. You guys follow this? There may be many ways in which we should be humans over being male or female. Or, you know, uh, there's, there's great value in cultivating androgynous qualities or asexual qualities, human qualities that are equally shared amongst men and women. But today is not Parent Day. Today is Father's Day. And so today is a day to celebrate Krishna as the father of the universe, as our father. Which means Krishna is the violent one. <laughs> which means Krishna as the dangerous one. Which means Krishna as our protector. Do you guys follow this? I'll keep going. Please. Thanks. You with me on this? To a large extent, in our particular sect of Indic spirituality, we like to think of Krishna as a child. We don't like to think of Krishna as a parent. We also like to think of Krishna as feminine not as masculine. Radharani is the feminine moiety, the feminine half of divinity. We like Radharani. She's all over the place in our temple. We like Radharani's mood. We think of ourselves as serving Radharani in the spiritual world. That's, that's our thing. And we don't even like thinking of God as a parent. We like thinking of God as a child because we've done this math that it's better for cultivating love, if you stop looking for your deity to do things for you, and you instead try and do things for your deity, and so who do we do things for without asking for anything in return? For our children. And so we like to think of God as a child, 
and it's female. It's important to make a distinction at this point between what we call lila on one side and what we call tattva on the other. Tattva literally means thatness. Tattva. Tva means ness and tat means that. So tattva means something which has thatness, something which exists, something which is true. Tattva refers to ontological and philosophical truth, things that actually exist, that are real, that have the quality of thatness. And then you like the, like the law of gravity would be a tattva. It's a real thing that has existence. And if you learn about it and understand it, you can then anchor yourself to it and liaise with it. Tattva. And siddhanta is another similar word. Siddhanta, siddha means perfect and anta means end. So sometimes we say perfect conclusion, but it's, the word siddha means finished or completed. Like siddha chow is cooked rice. So siddha means cooked or completed or finished. And so siddhanta means a finished conclusion. When you reach a philosophical conclusion and it's coherent and it makes sense and you can anchor yourself to it. So philosophical truth on one side and then lila and ras on the other side. Lila and ras are the feeling you have towards God, the sweet feelings you cultivate towards the deity and the way you envision ecstatic exchanges with the deity. This is lila and ras. I don't want to spend too much time on the words because we spend the rest of the class just defining those words. Um, Krishna as our father is not so much about lila and ras. It's more about tattva and siddhanta. And in the beginning, this stuff's important for us. For instance, cultivating faith that Krishna will protect me. Rakshishati Vishwas, one of the six symptoms of surrender that were written down well over a thousand years ago by the Sri Vaishnavas that we borrowed when we were coming up with our tradition five centuries ago. Rakshishiti Vishwas. Rakshishiti. Rakshishiti. He will protect. Iti. This is like, I think he will protect me. Vishwas. That faith. The faith that Krishna will protect you. Krishna says as much in the Gita. Mami kam shadanam braja. Take shelter of me. Aham tamam sarva pape bhya moksha ishami. I will deliver you. Mashucha. Don't fear. Yoga kshemam vaham yaham. I'll carry you what you lack and protect what you have. Krishna makes these type of protective statements in the Gita, and generally you find these type of protective statements all over religious literature anywhere in the world. There's some value in thinking of Krishna as your protector. There's some confidence you get from that. There's some solace you get from that. There's some fearlessness you get from that. There's incredible value in this. It's a little bit like, what's in it for me? Were you listening on your way in? Yes. It's a little bit, what's in it for me? So we don't try to spend too much time here. And we, we have to cultivate that feeling that Krishna will protect us so we can really surrender and let go and let God and be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And then we try to, before that becomes everything, we try to switch it and turn it into ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And we try to start to think about how we can serve Krishna, how we can love Krishna. And then we start to envision Krishna as a child. Or we cultivate more of a nurturing relationship with divinity more of a love-based, less of a fear-based, in which case Radharani becomes more prominent in our minds, or at least Radha and Krishna together as a combo. 
But if you're honest, most of us are not in a place where we can exclusively think about God as our child and selflessly serve. Most of us are not in a place where we can exclusively think about the nurturing aspect of divinity. Most of us still suffer from fear on some level. If you suffer from fear on any level, anywhere in the world, at any time, then you need to also think of the deity as powerful, as violent, as capable of protecting you, and therefore functionally as a father. If you think of Kali, with, her, you know, with all of her weapons, it's still a father figure. <laughs> it might be a feminine form, but the whole point of Kali is she's a subversive deity, and the female is taking the role of a male. That's the whole point of Kali. And so all those weapons in her hands that protect you, that's her acting as a father figure. So irrespective of whether it's a male or female form of divinity, the actual act of protection is a masculine act. Based on, it just boils down to like upper body strength. And for the deity, that becomes omnipotence. Krishna has unlimited hands. If he has unlimited upper body strength, he can protect you from all sides. So today is Father's Day, and if you feel fear in any aspect of your life, then when you reach out to the deity, part of the reason you're reaching out to the deity is for protection. And therefore, you need to think of the deity as your father. Even if you want to subvert it and have it being a mother playing the role of a father, that's fine. It's still fatherhood, in essence, which boils down to protection which boils down to power. And in the human species, in terms of our physical, corporal, corporeal existence, it boils down to upper body strength and the capacity for violence. Krishna will protect me from disease, from death, from other people that are more powerful than me and that I can't protect myself from. Krishna will provide for me those sentiments towards the deity, everyone has to pass through that village on their way to pure love. It's like base camp one or base camp two on your way to climbing Everest. And if you are at the peak of Everest and you can think of Krishna purely in nurturing terms or even more subversive, just think about what you want to do for Krishna and just love Krishna and never ask for anything in return. If you've gotten to that level, then you will appreciate base camp one and base camp two, and you'll know that those are necessary places for everybody to go through on their way to climb Everest, and you won't ever decry or criticize them. You'll see the value in it, the value of a powerful deity, a deity capable of protecting you from all the things out there in the world that, that give you fear to create some confidence, some lack of fear, such that you can begin to cultivate those finer and higher sentiments on that scaffolding. And Krishna's Aishwaryatva, or his Bhagavatva, his power, essentially, according to our theologians, runs like the Saraswati River through all of his pastimes. The Saraswati River in India <clears throat> um, dried up about 3,800 years ago. It's one of the evidences for the dating of the Vedic texts is the Vedic texts speak of the Saraswati River. And you know the Indus Valley Civilization? That's a Greek term, Indus, for the Sindh River, mispronounced Hind, and the Greeks called it the Indus River, it's of the Indus Valley Civilization. In the post-colonial period, Hindus have begun to refer to that as the uh, Saraswat Sindh, the Sindh River and the Saraswat River. In between those two rivers, on the Gangetic Plain is where one of the oldest civilizations in the world thrived. IVC, the Indus Valley Civilization, now known as the Sindh Saraswat Civilization by Indian pundits who are sick of letting British people tell them how to refer to their own culture. And so the Saraswati River dried up 3,800 years ago. Topographical maps demonstrate that. 
It's used as one of the evidences for the dating of the Vedic text. There are arguments against it. You can go, there's different like arguments back and forth on the subject. But um, that Saraswati River dried up a long time ago. And so, but it's a sacred river. So we say it never dried up. We just say it's flowing underground. It's there, even though it's not there. And when you go to the Triveni Sangha, when you go to Triveni Sangha in Prayag, renamed by the Muslims as Allahabad, in central India, northern India, the Triveni Sangha is Yamuna, Ganga, and Saraswati. But there's actually only two rivers there. There's Ganga, Yamuna are there. They come from Gangotri and Yamunotri up in the Himalayas. Not so far from Badrinath, where we go. Same thing, but just a little bit westward. Gungo tree is westward, and then further west is Yamuno tree. So those two rivers, they merge together in Prayag on their way across northern India. They kind of travel like this across India. If India is an upside-down triangle, they travel like this across and empty into the Bay of Bengal at Calcutta. Um, but we say no 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 when you bathe at Prayag all three rivers are there the Saraswati is underground so one of our theologians says that Krishna's Bhagavatva his power his Aishwaryatva his power runs through all of his pastimes You love Krishna however you want. He'll still pick up Govardhan Hill to protect you. And for thousands of years, our tradition, who worships Krishna as a child and just thinks about what they can do for Krishna, this Govardhan Leela of Krishna saving his devotees and protecting them in their moment of need, it to this day is like the core of our heart, is our confidence in that. It's a core element of surrender, is this feeling. Rakshishati Vishwas, I believe that Krishna will protect me. Gopritve Varanam, I believe he'll provide for me. It's another thing sometimes associated with fatherhood. It could also be motherhood, especially in a post industrial period. Um, as we cultivate selfless love for divinity as we just try to love Krishna like a child and think about what we can do for Krishna and stop asking for Krishna to do anything for us while we're cultivating that while we're conceiving of that Krishna's power is always there like an underground current and therefore devotees are fearless because they passed through that village that realization and they develop the faith that Krishna will protect me because he's the sea given father, because he's the father of the universe, because he's powerful, because he's unlimitedly powerful, because he has unlimited strength. And we, we, we have to pass through that realization. And we have to own that realization. We have to imbibe that realization. It has to go deep inside us and become part of our marrow. It has to get inside our bones and become something we never forget. And then with that, we can then move on to higher and higher ground on that strong scaffolding. It'll support us as we cultivate Rus, as we cultivate Leela, as we learn to appreciate Krishna in its feminine aspect, as we want to appreciate Krishna as a child, as an object of love, and then we can cultivate never asking Krishna for anything because we know that if we ever did need anything, Krishna would always be there. If you fall off a cliff, you'll say, Krishna, please save me. Pure devotion doesn't mean you don't say, Krishna, please save me. Vishwanath Chakravarti, our theologian, makes this point. We don't ask Krishna for anything, but this principle of Krishnaika Sharanam, that you always take shelter of Krishna, supersedes that. And so if there was for some reason ever a circumstance 
where you like need it, then you'll cry to Krishna, like with Kalia, like during the Govardhan Leela, like when Jatila comes to discover Radharani and Krishna having pastimes together, and Krishna turns into the deity of the sun. Radharani is offering Krishna flowers, and then Jatila comes. And rather than thinking in trouble, Krishna turns into the sun god. And Jyotiva thinks, oh, look, my daughter is worshipping the sun. This is very auspicious. And then leaves. And so Krishna's power, his Aishwaryatva, his Sarvagyata, his all knowingness, his power is always there. So on a day like today, as we appreciate the father figures in our life, as we approach. Sometimes we need father figures. Sometimes our fathers know more. Sometimes our father was not very fatherly. So then we need father figures in our life. And what are father figures? They're protectors. That's what they are. And you feel um, safe. And without feeling safe, you can't do anything else. You're on like the lowest rung of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you're trying just not to get killed, just not to get overwhelmed and there's no time for cultivating deeper thoughts. That feeling of safety allows you to springboard, launch into deeper topics of life. And that confidence in Krishna's paternal aspect, his fatherly aspect, is required to feel safe and is required for everything else and once you have that, and you see somebody else who's just on that part of the journey, you think, oh, you're in a great place. Even you may have, may have evolved beyond that, you appreciate the necessity of that, and you don't decry people who are working on their fundamentals. These are some thoughts I had around fatherhood, the deity, our sacred texts, our tradition, the value of it, where things go wrong, when differences become inequalities and exploitation, how people at a higher level can appreciate people at a lower level, how people at the lower level can feel like they're going to eventually get to the higher place, how to move through something without becoming caught up in it, how to not throw fatherhood. Oh, and by the way, if you enjoy the protection of your father figure, then when you grow up, you become the next generation's father figure. You follow this? My son wrote this to me today. He's not here. My eldest son wrote this to me today. Happy Father's Day. I want to start off by saying you're by far the most prominent role model in my life. Since I was young, you've always been the person I try to emulate. However, at 19 years old, being at this pivotal stage in my life where I'm attempting to figure out what my purpose is, now more than ever, I've come to admire and respect the man that you are. I feel like all the years you put into teaching me how to be a strong man, a man who protects women and children, a man who stands up for those in need. These qualities that you instilled in me since before I can even remember, they finally came into effect. Something happened and my son had to stand up to somebody who was an abuser. And my son had to put himself in harm's way just a few days ago and chastise this person. He's referring to that. It's, he speaks about it. I skipped over that part because I want to speak about the details. They came into effect. While thinking about the situation, I had the thought that to some minuscule degree, I finally followed in your footsteps. Because, Dad, above all else, you're a protector. I never had any fear of something traumatizing happening to me as a child because of how well you protected myself, my siblings, and mom. You give your life for your family and anyone else under your care in a heartbeat. 
And because of your example, these ideals that you've instilled in me, because of them, I was able to protect and redeem the honor of these people. Because of you, I have full confidence that nothing will ever happen to my future kids, my wife, and anyone else who may be placed under my care. There's more, but that's the part I wanted to read. Super sweet, right? Hare Krishna. So, as children, we need to enjoy the protection and the safety that our Father provides. And safety ultimately boils down to there's someone capable of violence watching your back, so therefore nothing's going to happen to you. And that safety allows you to move forward with confidence, free of fear, and achieve many wonderful things in life. If you didn't get that safety growing up, therapy essentially consists of going back and finding father figures and elders and mother figures and having them do a repeat for you. Whereas an adult, you cognitively go through that growth so that you then have that. And then if you're a father, if you're a, a man, then when you grow up, you have to cultivate strength. And you have to become the protector of the next generation. And as your elders gradually move from masculinity to androgyny, as people get older, they become more androgynous. So husbands and wives start to look like each other. It's because they stop producing estrogen and testosterone. And therefore, they go back to, if you see a child, like a six-year-old, and you dress a child up as a girl, you'll think it's a girl. You take a six-year-old and you dress him up like a boy, you think it's a boy. Because at that stage, the sex hormones haven't kicked in, and there's not really any difference between boys and girls. Strength-wise, athletic-wise, athletic there's no difference. Then puberty kicks in, and all of a sudden, you become a man or a woman, and there's a huge difference. And then as you get older, and you, you get into the... the menopause or manopause, you get this post-sexual stage of existence, you really move back towards the androgyny of your childhood. So men need to cultivate strength so that they can protect people, so that those people feel safe, so those people can become men and they can protect. We can introduce firearms, but at some point, we can set up laws, but at some point, there are people behind those laws, and when you don't follow them, they drive around and they hunt you down. Civilization is the threat of violence for people who don't play by the rules. There's always a ga gang of armed men driving around to stop people from hurting others. How tall are you? Sixty. What do you what do you walk around at? Weight? Yeah. Uh, two twenty five. Yeah, so he's like not even trying. Six three, two twenty five. He's not even trying. He's like not even lifting weights. He's just like hanging out, doing a little yoga. So he'd be on the upper end of the spectrum, and other of you are like not quite on that end of the spectrum. You're not six three, two twenty five. All of us have to cultivate strength. So that the people who are in our vicinity are protected. And then by doing that, we pass the baton to the next generation of men. And instead of being explorers, they become protectors. And instead of being dangerous to innocent people, they become dangerous to criminals. And the world becomes a better place. There's a place for fatherhood in the world. There's a place for masculinity in the world. It doesn't have to lead to exploitation, 
and inequality. For these reasons, Krishna freely makes use of sexual metaphors to describe the nature of his relationship to the world and to us. He's our father, he's our mother. He's the father of the universe, he's the mother of the universe. There's value in these ideas. There's always been value. There always will be value. We might be able to equalize the playing field to some extent. But these things will, are always going to be there. They're there in every species. They're there in all social mammals. And they're there in human society. Instead of hating it and trying to bury our head in the sand, we can own it, rise to the occasion. We can become a generation of men, and we can spawn a generation of men. Pass the baton. And reading that for my son was like a big deal. Not because of the appreciation he had for me, but because I realized that at the age of 19, he's the next generation. It just happened. He's a protector. He's a man. OK, those are my thoughts. I, I, there's a couple of minutes. You guys have some feedback for me? Yes, Prabhu. Hang on a second. Go, Paul. Give me one second. I have a Prabhupada disciple here named Prahlad Priya. I'll get to you in just a second, though. We, um, we Why don't you yell at me? Because they can hear you. We often refer to Shula Prabhupada as our father, that he was a father figure to us. So some of us who grew up without a real father figure, it, the, the profound nature of meeting Shula Prabhupada and seeing his impeccable character and knowing that we were going to try to become like Prabhupada or to follow in his footsteps. Go, Paul, can you hear him? Give me a this or a this. This is a quick statement. You can hear him? Okay. Prabhupada exhibited uh, all of those qualities that we wanted to emulate. You know, he wasn't big, he wasn't tall, he wasn't, you know, uh, uh, it was very slight, but powerful. Powerful by his behavior, powerful by his words, powerful by his example. Prabhupada was an ideal father figure. Prahlad Priya Prabhu said that many of the devotees who joined the Hare Krishna movement in the, in the 70s, like him, there's his son, so the next generation is here now. They'll be having kids soon. There'll be three generations in the same room. Um, that Prabhupada was a father figure, even though he was in the 70s, and Prabhupada had a slight build and what didn't, didn't cast an imposing shadow on people, but he was powerful and he had those qualities of a father. Interestingly, as, as a Vaishnava, we actually cultivate both masculine and feminine qualities. Prabhupada one time said this, he said you have to have, he, you have, to have the courage of an English soldier and the heart of a Bengali mother. And so within Vaishnavism, we cultivate transcendental qualities, androgynous qualities, nurturing qualities, and protecting qualities side by side. So much of what we do as devotees is we transcend sexuality, masculinity, and femininity. We transcend them. At the same time, Prabhupada also embodied them and had a very motherly, motherly part of his personality. It was very soft. And at the same time, was also very powerful. One time, Prabhupada was leading Kirtan in India, and some of his disciples were dancing. Some of his lady disciples were dancing. And some low class Indian men came there and tried to dance with them. And so Prabhupada was playing cartels and he immediately stopped and started swinging the cartels <laughs> like a flying guillotine, if you guys are fans of kung fu movies, at the heads of these people. And they jumped back and Prabhupada pointed at them and then went back to doing kirtan. And so... Yeah, <laughs> and so... Uh, um, no, nobody gets a pass. If you've got a male body, you need to cultivate strength. And you need to pass that on to the next generation. 
And when the next generation gets it and they become capable of carrying that legacy forward, essentially your work is done and you can die. Because you don't have to be afraid because you did your duty. Somebody made you a good man and then you pass it on to somebody else. Again, it's Father's Day, so we're talking about the male stuff. You walked in right now, you might be like, geez, he sounds like really like, it's like a class on masculinity. Well, you showed up late. That's your problem, not mine. I did a really nice balanced presentation. I did everything on the sun. You just chose to show up late. So don't expect the class to be perfect or complete. That would be ridiculous. I mean, like we were just sitting here quiet the entire time until you walked in in some sort of solipsistic fantasy where like everything has to only be said for your pleasure. <laughs> Gopal G. Gopal, by the way, is 41, 42? 39. Gopal's 39, married, two kids, just got guy diagnosed with cancer. He's fighting to stay alive. Go for it, Gopal. Oh, I, I really appreciated um, your presentation today because uh, I feel like most of my life has, has been a search for, for definitions of masculinity and, and what it means to be a man. Um, coming up from a place where you know, I grew up without a father, so I, I, I searched a lot for these, these father figures in my life. Uh, much of the time... Hang on, hang on. You're at the Sunday feast. There's like a hundred people here. Did you guys all hear that? Gopal grew up without a father figure. He spent most of his life searching for father figures. Keep going. And much of that time, um, I, I would come across the definition of masculinity morphing into, into mach machismo. Most of the time when we hear about masculinity, we think of it as machismo. Some sort of arrogant, braggart type thing. And that, that was never good enough for me. And, and ironically, it wasn't until I met you know, the, the Vaishnavs and, and the Vaishnav elders that I actually began to get a, 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 a more clear understanding of what it means to be a man in the world. Ironically, and, uh, he met the Hare Krishna devotees, who we don't present as being super masculine. In general, we're more on the asexual, androgynous, cultivating our feminine side, like most priests and most religions. But somehow or other, within that tribe, amongst the elders, he found examples of masculinity that he was able to emulate and get strength from. So, 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 so I really appreciate when, when, you know, when presentations like this are offered because, because it really puts things it really makes, th makes things make more sense. Um, on one final note, I, I, I do lament that there's a possibility that I will never be able to fill that role myself. He's lamenting that if he dies of cancer at the age of 39 or 40, he won't be able to provide that example himself for his kids, and he won't be able to pass the baton on the way it's our job to to take our realizations and pass them on to the next generation. Don't worry, Gopal. It's a good thing about being part of a tribe. We step in, and your wife's good. She'll, t she'll pick up the slack, and she's got all of us to lean on as well. And we'll take up that responsibility. That's part of what we do. So you having come to spirituality, come to such a good tribe of people, means that something happens to you it becomes our badge of honor to pick up the cross and carry it forward for you. All right. Anything else? Okay. Happy Father's Day to everybody. Thank you.